All right, so you are in a biology class. And so bio means life. The logos or the ology part is basically knowledge. So we're learning about living things. And so you could say, you know, basically your life is a biology lab, you know, all the time you're living biology. So there's a lot of different things that we're going to talk about. Um, first of all, living things are organized and they require or acquire materials and energy, reproduce, respond to stimuli. Like I say, okay, let's get started. You responded to that stimuli. There you go. Uh, living things are also what we call homeostatic, and we're going to talk about that word a lot, but basically the term homeostatic means that you have to stay in balance. So for instance, if it gets really hot outside like it was today, one of the ways that our body stays in balance is we sweat or we walk into an air-conditioned room and that helps us to stay in balance. It would not be a good idea to just like stand out in the heat, not drink anything and just be exposed. You'd probably end up dying. Living things grow and develop, we have a capacity to adapt. Now remember, you're not going to be able to write all this stuff down, you're not fast enough. But this is all on your PowerPoints on the website, okay? So keep that in mind. So again, if you want to print those out and bring them with you, or you want to download them to your computer, it'll be a little bit easier for you to follow along. But you're never going to be able to write this all down on your own. Okay, so one of the things I want you to know is what we call classifications of living things. So when we study in biology, um, biologists like to group things together, things that are similar, or what we would call organisms. So we like to put them into groups, and those groups are what we would call classifications. So you might do a classification in this class, and I might say, okay, all the girls to the right, and all the guys to my left, and then I just classified living organisms, okay? Or I might say, okay, everybody with red hair in the east corner, everybody else in the west corner, and I just made classifications. So this is also what's called systematics. This is, in biology, the study of these classifications. Okay, so we might want to study redheads, okay, or whatever it may be. So when they used systematics, they came up with a term called domains. And a domain is the largest classification. So we might say the domain is every living organism on the planet. That's a domain. It's a huge group of things all together. So biologists assign organisms into basically three domains, okay? This is based on like genetics, and this is based on the different chemistry of these organisms' bodies. So these are the three domains. We have what's called archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. So archaea is kind of sort of like bacteria, uh, but it's interesting, you know, as scientists start studying different things, they started finding these little teeny tiny creatures um, that sort of kind of were like bacteria, but not really all together like it. And they're like, hmm, we've got to come up with a, a new group for these guys or a new domain. So we're going to call it archaea because it's like they're archaic, they're ancient types of bacteria. And if you remember, maybe you took biology class in high school or something, but um, have you ever heard the term of a cell? Okay, pretty common term. So we're made up of cells. Bacteria is made up of a cell. Archaea is made up of a cell. Cells are the smallest living unit of life. A cell has the ability to live outside of your body. So if I took some of your cells and I put them in a dish and I gave them nutrients and oxygen, they could live. They don't need you. They could live all by themselves. 
If I took bacteria and I put them in a dish and gave them plenty of nutrients and took care of them, they could live because they're a single cell. They don't need anything else. But if I took one of your cells and the stuff that's inside the cell, which we'll talk about, but the stuff inside, if I took some of that stuff out, it couldn't live by itself. It has to be in the cell. So the cell is the smallest living unit of life. And archaea are just made up of one cell. They're what we would call unicellular, and uni means one. So an archaea, or an ancient kind of bacteria, is a single cell type of bacteria. Now here's the weird thing about these guys. They live in extreme environments. And so we'll talk about the kind of weird environments that they can live in. But let's go to bacteria first. They are also made up of just a single cell. So just like the archaea, they're a kind of bacteria, regular old bacteria that makes us sick. Uh, they're made up of a single cell too. Eukarya, that's you and me. We're a eukarya. We're multicellular. You've got billions, trillions of cells that make up your body or my body. A bird would be considered eukarya. A squirrel is eukarya. Plants are eukarya. Anything that's made up of multiple types of cells. So if we're talking about the domain archaea and the domain bacteria, which are both single cells, they are called prokaryotes. If you're talking about the domain eukarya, which is basically all the plants, all the animals, all the birds, they are called eukaryotes. So you are a eukaryote, a bacteria would be a prokaryote. So archaea, some of the strange places that they live would be in uh, like aquatic environments, water environments, but not just any old water environments. These are really funky, where you would never want to swim type of water environments. So like, um, I don't know, have you ever been to the Salton Sea? The Salton Sea is this huge, gigantic lake that's kind of out towards Palm Springs area, and it is super salty. And it's got a lot of salt in it, and you can find archaea there. They can live in very, very salty environments where most bacteria, and of course humans, a lot of animals, can't live in that kind of salty environment. They also will live in like hot springs. So they, in this classroom right now, all right, it's about 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which is somewhere around 25 degrees Celsius. These type of archaea can live like in the hot springs in Yellowstone, and it's about 75 degrees Celsius in those hot springs, which makes it close to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So they can live in really super hot environments. Um, another thing is that they can live in um, an environment that doesn't have a lot of oxygen. So they can live in environments that have a lot of like methane. So if you're like in the room with my grandson who farts all the time, they're probably alive in that room. Everybody else is dead. No, anyway. So uh, you get the idea. So they live in some very unusual types of environments. Bacteria. This is the other domain. So this is our second domain. Uh, they can live just about anywhere too. Uh, it's just they can't live like too salty, too hot, too cold. But they're in the, they're in the dirt, they're in the air, uh, they're in our, on our skin, they're in our digestive tract. And some cause diseases and some are actually beneficial. Now we're not going to talk a lot about bacteria or archaea in here because this is a human biology class, so we're going to talk mostly about humans, which are the eukarya, uh, but just so that you know what these other domains are made of or what they consist of. So eukarya, this is the big one, this is the one we really care about. Uh, it is, so we have the domain, okay? <laughs> That's the domain. Now we're going to take eukarya and break it down into four kingdoms. Because you know, all the multicellular, you got birds and 
animals, humans, plants, that kind of thing. So we're going to break this down into four basic kingdoms. So kingdom number one, we have Protista. Kingdom number two, we have Fungi. Kingdom number three, we have Plantae. And then kingdom number four, we have Animalia. So those are the four basic kingdoms. And they come from the domain Eukarya. So protista this is basically algae, mainly algae, a couple different molds, fungi, I think you could probably figure that out, like mushrooms, like the yeast that you put in bread, and then a few different types of molds are also fungi, and planting, these are plants. So ferns, flowering plants, plants that have leaves, wood type plants like trees, those are all part of the plant kingdom. And then animalia, these are all the animal kingdom. So these are the birds, the reptiles, amphibians, humans, mammals, those are all animalia. Okay, so now, we've talked about domain, we talked about kingdom. Then, the next thing that we would break the kingdoms down into would be like phylum, class, break the phylum down into class, break the class down into order, break the order down into family, break the family down into genus, and break the genus down into species. And so you have to memorize this. So maybe you can memorize it this way. Dumb King Philip came over for a good spaghetti. You got to know it. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I'll let you do all the writing today, but you got to be prepared next Tuesday because I'm not going to stand around and let you write all this. You've got it in your PowerPoints. It says the same thing. And I want you to know that you get more and more exclusive, smaller and smaller, less and less things are in the group as you go down, from domain all the way down to species. eukaryotic kingdoms. Okay, so if we were to take this and go from domain to kingdom, to phylum, class, order, family, genus, uh, the domain would be cells that have nuclei, which we'll talk about what that means. The kingdom is animalia, so whatever we're talking about is multicellular. What does the word motile mean? Huh? No. Mm -mm. What does motile mean? Say it again. What does motile mean? 
Say again? Okay. They can move. Okay? Pedestals, that means they have the ability to move. They ingest food. That means they eat. So whatever we're talking about here, okay, you got to guess what this is. All right, I want you to guess what kind of creature I'm talking about. This creature has cells with nuclei. It is multicellular. It's motile. It ingests food. It has a dorsal supporting rod with nerve cords. What's a dorsal fin? Ah, it's the one on the back. So this has a dorsal supporting rod and a nerve cord in their back because it's dorsal, that's back. They have hair and mammary glands. They're adapted to climb trees. They're adapted to walk erect. And they have a large brain and can use tools. Can you imagine which animal this is? Could you not also say it's a chimpanzee? Except this is the genus Homo, which is for human. So human would be a Homo sapien. This would be a human. So when we name something, we typically give it two names, the genus name and the species name. So the genus name would be Homo, and sapien would be for human. Felis domesticus. Can you figure out which animal that is? A cat. A cat. Very good. Very good. All right, so another term for you to memorize. Biosphere. The biosphere is a zone of air, land, and water on the surface of the earth. Basically where all the organisms live. So anything in that animalia kingdom is living in your same biosphere. <coughs> Another term, population. This is groups of individuals in a species in a certain area. So you might look at what is the population of the city of Victorville of all of the Homo sapiens. Anybody have any idea? Maybe about 200,000 people in Victorville, because that's what Homo sapiens are, right? Humans. So I'm asking, what's the population of all of the humans in Victorville? I think we have about 200,000 people. It's a big town now. Community. This is a population of different species that interact. Okay, so somebody tell me a community of different species that interact, that you're aware of. Ever thought about any type of species that interact? You're a certain species. Do you interact with any other species? Dogs. Dogs. You and your dog are a community. <coughs> How cute. <laughs> okay? You walk through the woods. You take a hike. You're walking through a certain type of community. There's different types of plants in that community. Maybe there's some molds in that community. So you are a type of species, and so are they. So this is what we would consider a community in biology. An ecosystem. This is interaction of communities plus the actual habitat, the physical habitat they live in. So an ecosystem would be the desert. Or an ecosystem would be the ocean. Or another ecosystem might be like the high Sierras and the type of forest. So those are different ecosystems. Anybody know what San Diego is as an ecosystem? You ever been there? what we would call a high chaparral. It's an in-between desert and forest. So ecosystems, you look at the what we call chemical cycling. So that's like the oxygen and the different things that go on in that system. 
the energy flow. That means the kinds of plants and animals, how they interact with each other. Okay, so that's how ecosystems are looked at. So you know there's going to be different chemicals in the ocean and the animals and plants that interact with each other in the ocean in comparison to, obviously, the desert. Humans, of course, we have ecosystems uh, that we're able to survive in. We can survive very uh, nicely in multiple different ecosystems. So you can survive in the rainforest, you can survive in the desert. <clears throat> and then, of course, we have this really nasty habit of modifying ecosystems for our own use. And sometimes that's not necessarily always the best thing. Sometimes we modify it just a wee bit too much. Uh, and so obviously it's very important for us to also, if we're going to modify, to try to ensure that certain species survive. Biodiversity. Can you count the total number of species in a certain area? So how many different species of birds are there in the desert? A lot. Matter of fact, the desert has more species of birds than any other ecosystem. So how diverse or how different, how many different types of species are there in a particular ecosystem tells us the biodiversity. And then, of course, what are the genetic differences? So a lot of times, you know, you might have certain types of rabbits all living in the same area together, but they look similar, and then you start looking at their genetics, and even though they look very similar, their genetics are very different. And so there's a lot of biodiversity. As a matter of fact, the more biodiversity, the healthier the ecosystem. Okay, so we're going to talk about this. You don't have to write this down, but we're going to go through, and you can't see it down here, but it says atoms. We're going to talk about atoms first. Then we're going to go to molecules. Then we're going to talk about the cells in our body, because it's all about humans. And then we're going to talk about how those cells make tissue, and how those tissues make organs, and how all those organs work together to make organ systems, and then that makes us and then we'll get into how we affect the rest of the world by the end of this semester. So these are just some of the different ecosystems we talked about. You know, like coral reef is a big one. Um, here's something for you to know. We are losing to extinction about 400 species of plants and animals per day due to human activity. Uh, I have a ranch, and uh, I live about uh, 30, 40 miles away from here. And uh, on my ranch, I raise endangered species livestock. That means that most people don't realize you have chickens that are going extinct. You have pigs that are going extinct. You have cows and sheep and goats and things that we eat that are going extinct. As a matter of fact, every year there is about anywhere between 5 to 15 types of farm animals that go extinct off the face of the planet. Uh, for instance, I raise a type of goose. It's called a cotton patch goose. I have 50 of these geese. There are only about 100 of them in the world. So I own half of this species of geese. That's really scary. Uh, I raise a kind of pig called a guinea hog. It comes from Africa. And guinea hogs, uh, we started using those pigs to replace heart valves in humans. So we would slaughter those pigs. People in the United States would slaughter the pigs, take the heart valve out of the pig, and give it to the human, which is fine, except they slaughtered so many of these pigs that there are only about 300 of them left in the entire world. So we have to realize that it's not just wild animals like bald eagles and tigers that we're not taking real good care of and they're going extinct, but so is our food. And that's a little bit scary because we're losing our food supply. And by the way, it's the same thing even with plants. There are certain types of corn, certain types of peas, certain types of apples that are actually going extinct. And you know why? 
because we're now growing seedless everything. We don't grow watermelon with seed very much anymore because everybody likes it seedless. Well, what the heck are you going to do when there are no seeds left? And who's storing those seeds? Who's responsible to make sure that those watermelon don't go extinct? Who's taking the responsibility for that? And by the way, the answer is nobody. So there's a lot of stuff out there that uh, we'll talk about. I'm going to show you some videos on all of this so that you're aware of some of the things that are going on in your ecosystem around you that can really affect us in a few years. It's a little bit scary in my opinion. So like I said, we're going to go from atoms, which is the smallest part of life, to molecules. Then we're going to talk about molecules and how they form cells. And we'll talk about how cells form tissue and how tissues form organs. And then how we put organs together to form organ systems, which basically makes you and me. Okay. All right, so part of what we're doing in here is studying anatomy. And that's all about what pieces our body's made up of. What's the name of this bone? What's the name of that bone? What's the name of this organ? And in lab, you're going to do all this. You're going to study bones. You're going to touch bones, feel bones, name bones. You're going to study the organs. You're going to see the heart and the liver and the lungs and all that good stuff. And I'll show you a dead body. You can see it all together. So you're going to have to learn a lot of the anatomy of the body, okay? Which will be really cool. But we're also going to study physiology in here, which is how the body also works. So how does it function? So anatomy is all about form or structure. And physiology is all about function and how it works. Okay, so we'll talk about how does the heart work, how does the brain work, that kind of thing. Okay? Any questions so far? We good so far? I can see you're not totally asleep, just yawning, but not totally asleep. That's good. Okay, whoa, you can't even really read that. Okay, so just forget what those words say up there except homeostasis. I want you to know homeostasis. The term homeostasis means balance. Your body and my body, we have to stay in balance. If our body isn't in balance, we get sick. So anytime the body goes out of balance, and y'all want to be nurses, so this is our doctors, this is the important part. Anytime the body goes out of balance and we get sick, we call this pathology. So if we're in balance, we have physiology. If we go out of balance or out of homeostasis, our patient gets sick and they have a pathology. Okay? So your job when you're working in the medical field is you're going to take that person who has the pathology and bring them back into balance or back into homeostasis or back into physiology. That's very important. So let me give you an, a simple uh, example. Now, our bodies, all day, every day, they go out of balance, but not too far out of balance. And our body has a lot of different mechanisms to help us bring it back into balance. So for instance, you're sitting right here in your chair, and while you're sitting there, you have a certain blood pressure. Now we all have to have blood pressure, because blood pressure is what makes our blood flow through our system, okay? But if you were to stand up, real fast. I get you to stand up, hop up real fast. Your blood pressure would change because gravity takes effect and starts pulling your blood down to your feet. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, like maybe you've been kneeling down for a long period of time and then you pop up really fast and you're like, oh, got a little dizzy there. Okay, because gravity pulls your blood down into your feet. Now, because you're nice and healthy, it doesn't stay in your feet for but a second because your body starts immediately pushing that blood right up to your brain so that you don't pass out. But some people will have trauma or they will have diseases where if they stand up too quickly, they don't have the mechanisms to get that blood back up to the brain and they will faint. 
because they have a pathology that doesn't control their blood pressure well, and you don't. You have a physiology that's nice and healthy and controls your blood pressure, so you can pop up and down out of your seat all day, and you won't faint at all. And you won't even know that your blood pressure changed slightly, but bam, it came back to normal really, really fast. Or let's try this one. Let's say that I have a college student who uh, maybe they didn't get to eat lunch today, okay? So they didn't get to eat lunch today, so they decided, oh, what the heck, you know, I gotta go to class, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna grab a Snickers bar and a Coke, okay? Now there's a heck of a lot of sugar in that, right? And you and me, all the time, we have sugar floating around in our bloodstream. We use sugar like energy, like gas in your car. You got a lot of sugar in the blood. So let's pretend that this is like the normal level of sugar in our blood. And I'll just write blood sugar right here so you get it. And now this person just ate this candy bar and had this Coke. It gets into their stomach and then moves from their stomach into their blood. What do you think the level of blood sugar is going to be? Uh, high, yeah, exactly. Uh, so we're going to see it go, whoa, way up. Now is that okay? Is it okay if their blood sugar goes up? What do you think? No. Heck yeah, your blood sugar goes up all the time. You don't die by eating a Coke and a candy bar, right? I mean, I've eaten it. Blood sugar goes up. But here's where the no comes in. It, is that for me? No? Is it my manager asking me to do a movie or something? No? Okay. Uh, I was just wondering. You ever see the movie Cholo's Tribe? It's like a, a MTV thing. They came out to my ranch a couple weeks ago. Really? Yeah, they came out to my ranch and uh, they hit me hysterical. They're, they're, they're total gangbangers from LA, okay? Uh, most of them have been out of prison and now they have a TV show, right? Or a, a, a HBO thing. And uh, so they came out to the ranch and uh, they shot their whole thing there and they wanted to like kill a chicken. You know, so real ranch life, what's it like to be on a farm and everything. These guys are totally tatted from head to toe, right? They were too afraid to do it. They're all sissies. Okay, anyway, okay. Uh, but it was, it was a lot of fun to play with them. Give them a hard time the whole time. So anyway, so we'll go back to the student who was eating this candy bar, had the soda, blood sugar levels are high. And the big problem is if the blood sugar levels stay high for long periods of time. We want those blood sugar levels, okay, that's fine, they can go up but they better come back down to normal, get us back to homeostasis pretty dang quick. Because what do we call the disease or what do we call the pathology that somebody has when their blood sugar levels go up and they stay up for long periods of time? What do we call that? That's diabetes, right? And that's a no-no, we don't want to have that. Well, here's another question. Why don't we want to have that? What the heck? What's so wrong with having that? Okay, so, real simple. Let's pretend um, that I'm going to buy a frying pan. And I'm going to buy a pretty nice frying pan. I don't want anything to stick in my frying pan. So I'm going to buy like one of those Teflon coated frying pans. You've seen those before, right? So if I take that frying pan and I like crack open an egg in it, and I cook my egg in this brand new Teflon frying pan, how do I get the egg out of my frying pan? Could I just not like dump the frying pan and it would just like slide right out? Because that's the whole idea with buying one of these Teflon frying pans, right? Nothing's supposed to stick to them, right? Have you ever used one of those? Some of you are looking at me like you've never heard of this before. Okay? So, all right. So, okay. So, you get it. I get it. Okay. So, now, the inside. So, we got all these blood vessels carrying our blood everywhere, right? And the inside of our blood vessels are slick. They're smooth. They're kind of like a Teflon coated frying pan. Nothing sticks to them. Nothing at all. But then, what if I do this? What if I take my brand new Teflon coated frying pan and I take a fork and I scratch the crud out of that frying pan with the fork? And then I scramble an egg in it. How am I going to get the egg out of that frying pan now? Uh, yeah, you're not. It's like stuck all in there, right? Well, if I eat a bunch of sugar, and that sugar stays in super high levels in my bloodstream 
for long periods of time, that sugar will act like the fork on my Teflon frying pan. That sugar will scrape the walls of my smooth, slick blood vessels and make them all scratchy and then things stick. So if I'm a patient who has diabetes, I've got sticky blood vessels and I start getting all these clogs in all my blood vessels and maybe I get clogs in my leg, in my blood vessel and there's no blood going <clears throat> to my foot and eventually my foot turns black and you're going to have to amputate my foot. Or maybe I'm a diabetic patient who gets clogs in the blood vessels in my eyeball and there's no blood going to my eyeball and now I go blind. And this is what's wrong with having high levels of sugar in the blood for super long periods of time. So what we need to do is if I'm going to eat that candy bar and I'm going to drink that soda and my blood sugar levels are going to go up, I need them to come back down. I need them to get back to normal. So right about here, we have an organ, okay? And this organ is called the pancreas. And does anybody know what the pancreas will release when sugar levels go up? Insulin. Insulin, very good. So the pancreas kind of sort of has like a little computer chip in it and is constantly monitoring how much sugar we have in our blood. And if those levels go up, the pancreas releases this insulin. So you see the insulin levels go up as well. Okay, so now what the heck does insulin do to help us with this problem of high sugar levels? Okay, so on the outside of every one of the cells of our body, there are doors or gates. And these doors or these gates are all shut and they're all locked. And it's kind of like you can almost think of like, you know, the parking lot at the mall. You got all these cars in the parking lot and they're all locked. Now, let's say you had like the old fashioned keys that could get into the car. If you've got one set of keys, you're not gonna be able to open every single car in that mall parking lot, right? You're gonna be able to open hopefully just like one car. I did that one time. I don't remember where I was, but I was in some big parking lot. And you know how you just sort of kind of think, you know, your car is right here. And I don't know, you've probably walked up like I have to a car I thought was mine. And I'm not really paying attention. I put the key in. I turned it. And holy crap, that car door opened. And I started to get in. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, this is not my car. And you know how I knew? It was way too clean. <laughs> it was like, whoa, this is a freaking clean car, but I was able to open this person's car. I really wanted to see if I could start it too, you know, but no, I didn't do it. I just locked their car and left. Uh, but anyway, my car was just like two cars over. But these doors on the outside of our cells, they have specific keys that will open them and insulin would be like the key that can open some of these doors. Now, so when insulin goes up, it pops some of these doors open and what will happen is the sugar leaves our blood and it goes into the door, into the cell, and we fill that cell up and it uses it for energy. So if we pop these doors open and the sugar comes out of the blood and goes into the cell, what will happen to the levels of sugar in our blood? It drops, exactly. So now look what happens when insulin levels go up, eventually our sugar levels will go back down to normal. We go back to homeostasis. We don't destroy the inside of our blood vessels. We don't lose our foot. We don't get diabetes. Now, what do you think would happen to the insulin levels when blood sugar levels go down? Will they stay up? Will insulin levels go down? What do you think happens? Now, I'd say, yeah. It would be smart. Why would you waste all this insulin? Why would you keep it up if your blood sugar levels just dropped? You know, just stop making it. And that's exactly what happens. So this is just an example of how we maintain homeostasis. So if I eat a candy bar and drink a soda, my blood sugar levels might go up, but my body can make insulin, my pancreas is still healthy, and my blood sugar levels will come down in maybe 30, 45 minutes. But what if I really ate bad? 
what if I had like pop tarts for breakfast and I had a frappuccino at like 10 o'clock and then I had you know maybe a sandwich with chips and a candy bar for lunch um, what would happen to my blood sugar levels? They'd be all out of whack. And let me tell you, they'd be up just about all day long. And people who eat all this junk food all day long, their blood sugar levels are up all day long, just like they're diabetic. Even though they can make plenty of insulin, even though their pancreas works plenty well, and this is one of the reasons why so many of your patients will have cardiovascular disease because they eat too much sugar or what we'll talk about later, too many carbohydrates all frigging day long.